Welcome to the Dell Wamsley Radio Show. <laughs> Dell challenges the status quo, questions everything, and empowers you to return to your core beliefs to make your life better. If you're ready to hear the truth and get your roadmap to the lifestyle you really want, the next hour will change your life. And now your host, self-made millionaire, national award-winning investor of the year, CEO and founder of Lifestyles Unlimited, Del Wamsley. Welcome to the Del Wamsley Radio Show, where the hype ends and the help begins. I'm your host, Del Wamsley, and as always, we're working on your financial freedom. My friends, today I'm going to wander down the path of what's it all about, Alfie. You know, we've all heard that song, but has anybody really thought about what is it all about? Have you ever stopped long enough in this race to get ahead in this world to just sit back and go, what does it really all mean? What? I can't take any of this stuff with me. You don't see hearse carrying or, or pulling a trailer behind them, taking your stuff with you when you go. So what is enough is enough is enough. I talk to Lifestyles members about this, the top ones, all the time. You know, obviously, when you're at the bottom, you're trying to establish yourself. You're trying to build up wealth. You're trying to build your passive streams of income up to where you want to get to and or where you can afford to retire if you want. All that's true. But what I found is that very successful people, which there are a lot of them in Lifestyles, they can't turn it off. They can't even slow it down in many cases. Now, some people do, but in most cases, really successful people are driven to be successful at the cost of not actually being successful. What do I mean by that? Their lives are just as complicated as if they worked in corporate America and they're working day in, day out, on and on and on. I was just trying to find somebody to do some work on my house. And this guy called me up, a a vendor, and and I tried to set him up to come in and get him to do some work. And he goes, your name sounds familiar. And I said, yeah, I'm on the radio, whatever. The guy then said, well, man, I've been thinking about flipping houses and whatever. And I said, well, that's not really what we teach. We teach owning them and building wealth and retiring. And the guy goes, man, I don't even know how you could say something like that. I've been working 30 years at my business and I'm working harder now than I ever did. And I said, sir, that's because you're working in your business. The very fact that you own the business and you're calling me to set an appointment to do work, it just screams at me that you have no idea how to run a business. You are working in a business. You have a job in a company. Maybe you own the company, but you still have a job in that company. And that is not working on your business. And so we talked for a little while longer, and he said he'd probably want to come by and try to learn some of that stuff. And then he was kind enough to go, I think I'll push you up the uh, long list of people who don't work for. I think we'll see if I can push you up the list here. And it was fun. But the points got me thinking, what is it? Where did I actually come up with the idea that I don't want to work? Now, for years, I've joked, by the way, and I don't even know if it is a joke, but I joke that everything I do, I do for women. What do I mean by that? I'd be willing to live in a box under a bridge was my old statement when I was younger. And really, we did. We lived in a little teeny tiny one bedroom apartment, two or three of us as bodybuilders, power lifters. We worked out all day long. We ate, worked out, ate, worked out, ate, worked out, slept, played games, bouncers at bars, really had no real goals in life other than be big and strong. Could have lived in that and called that a box under a bridge. But somewhere along the line, you get out there and you get this desire to get ahead. And you start working and working and working and work harder and harder and longer and longer and harder and harder, longer, 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 longer. You got it. Here you are today and you're still not rich. You're not retired. You have nothing. So I started trying to figure out where it was because I am a certified recovering workaholic. I used to be a workaholic. I've completely given it up. So I went through, as a young kid, being After everything, sports, fitness, success, grades, school, blah, blah, blah. And then jumping into this bodybuilding, powerlifting world where we didn't really care about anything except powerlifting and bodybuilding. And then coming back out and getting into business and work in corporate America and working 12 hours a day, six days a week, workaholic, workaholic. Then I went out and started my own business and bought single family houses, had one, four, eight, 20, 50, 100 of them all of a sudden within a year or so. And I'm working again. And then I decided, no, slow it down, buy an apartment complex, and move all that work to the manager. And my life completely changed. 
because all of a sudden I wasn't working in the business. I owned a business with a manager, with maintenance team, and I did nothing. And I tried to think back to where it was that that really came about. And I think I found it. It is a short story that I'm going to read to you verbatim because I don't want to mess it up. I've heard the story, by the way, three or four different times from three or four different versions. I think this story has been redone in almost every nationality in the world. You know, I've seen an Indian version. I've seen a Hawaiian version. I've seen an Alaskan version. I've seen a, a European version. I've seen an island version. This one is the Mexican version, so don't take offense to that. It just happens to be the one I found on the Internet. And it goes as. An American investment banker was at a pier in a small coastal Mexican village when a small boat with just one fisherman docked. Inside the small boat were several large yellowfin tuna. The American complimented the Mexican on the quality of his fish and asked how long it took him to catch them. The Mexican replied, only a little while. The American then asked, why didn't you stay out longer and catch more fish? The Mexican said he had enough to support his family immediate needs. The American then asked, but what do you do with the rest of your time? The Mexican fisherman said, I sleep late. I fish little, play with my children, take siestas with my wife, Maria, stroll in the village each evening where I sip wine and play guitar with my amigos. I have a full and busy life. The American scoffed. I'm a Harvard MBA and I could help you. You should spend more time fishing with the proceeds by a bigger boat. With the proceeds from the bigger boat, you could buy several boats. Eventually, you would have a fleet of fishing boats. Instead of selling your catch to a middleman, you would sell directly to the processor, eventually opening your own cannery. You could control the product processing and distribution. You would need to leave the small coastal fishing village and move to Mexico City, then L.A., and eventually New York, where you will run your expanding enterprise. The Mexican fisherman asked, but how long will this all take? Which the American replied, 15 to 20 years. But what then, asked the fisherman? The American laughed and said, that's the best part. When the time is right, you would announce an IPO, sell your company, stock to the public, and become rich. You would make millions. Millions then what? The American said, then you would retire. Move to a small coastal fishing village where you would sleep late, fish a little, play with your kids, take siestas with your wife, and stroll to the village in the evenings where you could sip wine and play your guitar with your amigos. There it is, folks. There's the reality of happiness. Think about that. This story is unbelievably true. What do we all work towards? What do we get up and grind and grind every day for? But to get back to the point where we don't have to grind. What's it all about? Why do we do that? You know, I catch myself all the time in this situation where I started buying companies again, started buying businesses again. And I bought several last year, and I've already got two purchased and three in contract to buy this year. Each business makes me about $10,000 more, so I added about fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 a month last year. I'm going to add another $50,000 a month this year. And then I had gotten into the deal where I had three more lined up to buy. And then I just said, whoa, slow down here. Stop, cut, whoa, wait. Because I found myself working again, working at getting all these things done. Now, setting up a company and starting a company and starting a business and all, it's not as much work as working in the business. But there's still time to invest. We'll take a short break, be right back with the rest of the story. Now, here's some more unconventional wisdom to set you free from the man on a mission to retire America, one person at a time, Del Wamsley. And what we're talking about today is what's it all about. And the concept that it's not the money, it's the lifestyle is something that I created 30 years ago and developed over this 30-year period of time. What's interesting about all this is that when I'm looking at it, it's really an individual thing. Everybody has a different idea of what they want in their life. And so as I work through this with you here today, I'm finding myself at this point where I want to go to this email that I got the other day because it really was the stimulus for this whole set of concepts that I'm revisiting here. I got an email from a guy that was just really outrageous. The email seemed outrageous to me. And it seemed outrageous to me because it was almost as if the guy from the story, the Mexican fisherman, was talking to me. 
It's that scary. That's how scary this email is. And I want to share it with you. Now, the person in the email said he wanted to come on the radio show and tell people this stuff, but he never gave me permission to use his email, so I'm not going to give you his name. He may come back and tell me he wants to get his name out there, but right now I'm just going to keep it to myself. But it's a real email. And so I'm going to read it to you because there's no other way to do it justice. Uh, I can't even paraphrase this. It says, I listen to your radio show often. I can relate to your message of desperation in the workplace and slowly dying. I was laid off as a software engineer because the company wanted to downsize American workers and outsource much of their IT, I guess across in in another country. I was going to lose my house, so I got roommates. I moved to the garage, built a third bedroom in the living room with a makeshift wall bookcase from my IKEA. My income went up $1,600 per month just from the roommates. Some of these renters have been real jackweeds, but at least they pay money. My renters pay for the mortgage plus taxes and insurance and utilities. The biggest change in my life has been the stress lifted off of me. Now I drive a school bus and have summers off to pursue water sports. I surf in June, I kayak in July, and I windsurf in August more or less. With COVID and school out, I have been traveling locally and sleeping in my van. I've been living the great lifestyle that you talk about on your radio show. This winter, I traveled to California and surf and rock climb, to Las Vegas, to mountain bike, and to Idaho and Montana to do some frozen pond ice skating. All it cost me was the gas and some money for my car repairs. What let me do it was the passive income that freed me from daily job. All right, now it goes on and I'll come back to it, but I just want to stop right there and just let's all catch our breath. Can you imagine this guy is equating what he did to my theories? Now, I don't understand how he sees those as parallel, and yet I do. What he's saying is in his own simple way, he used creating $1,600 a month of passive income to completely free him up to do whatever he wants to do in his life. Now, I met another person like this back when I was consulting, way, way way back in the beginning. I ran into a guy that owned a little frame house on the edge of of a little lake. He had a little canoe boat or a little fishing boat, and he worked at an oil refinery, and he worked what are called shutdowns. Shutdowns mean they shut the plant down to clean everything and to to make sure everything works right. So, which meant he would work for like six or seven 12-hour days in a row, And then he was off and he might be off for months. And so when he came in, I asked him, how much money do you need to replace your income? And he says, I need to make about $1,500 a month. And I said, man, that's only like five houses. And he goes, okay. And so we set up a plan for him to go buy five houses and retire. Now, in my mind, can you imagine retiring with $1,500 a month? He said, well, I don't need any more than that. You know, my house is free and clear. Probably got it from his grandpa, and they probably paid it off 50 years ago. Just a little frame house on a lake. He said, I don't really need much. I fish, and I eat that food. I need some beans and rice to go with it, probably. You know, I don't even know if he had a car or not. But if he did, I'm sure it was an inexpensive one that he maintained himself. But that was it. We set up the plan. He bought the five houses, and I never saw him again. He retired. Now, that's what this guy here is saying. He created a rental brothel. Now, by the way, let's talk about it's not the money, it's the lifestyle. I just want you all to know this. I would never live with roommates at any age. When I was in college, I had one roommate drove me crazy. But to have three other people you don't even know living in your house. And by the way, in the rest of the story here, he talks about some of the problems that that created. But I just want you to fixate on this point as we end up working through this is that To him, life was about getting out there and enjoying life. Now, you can't knock that. Now, I can't see living with three other people and and moving into a garage. But at the same time, I remember telling people when I was a kid, give me a box under a bridge as long as I could just play my guitar and go and work out. So I don't know how old this guy is, by the way. I don't think he says in here. He might, but I don't remember it. But can you imagine? Now, what I'm asking you is, okay, this guy got it right for himself. Right out of the blocks. Do you have an idea in your mind at all what enough is enough? Is there a get-off point for you where enough is enough? I came to the conclusion when I was 50 years old, 
I had enough. In fact, I actually came to that conclusion at 40 that I had enough. But the weird thing about passive income is it keeps it growing because you don't go to work. So you have money. You're living on less than what you earn. You invest more money. You end up making more money. Now you make even more than you don't need. So now you save even more than you saved before. And then you have to do something with the money. So you invest again. And then you make more money. And I've just come to the conclusion I just can't beat the cycle. I've just got to live the cycle, which is this. Take a few days each month, a few weeks each year, and go buy some more businesses. Get it over with. Get that money deployed. Get it out there working for you. And then just go have fun. Just go live life, whatever that means to you. Does it mean to you singing, playing your guitar, or spending time with your amigos, or spending time with your wife and your kids, sports like this gentleman? What is it? It's not the money. Money does not create happiness. Money creates security. And money will enhance what you can do with your happiness, but it doesn't create happiness. Happiness comes from within knowing that you're living the life that you want. We'll take a short break. Be right back with the Dell Walmsley Radio Show. Now, here's some more unconventional wisdom to set you free from the man on a mission to retire America, one person at a time, Del Wamsley. Welcome back to Del Wamsley Radio Show. Today, we're covering a topic called, What's It All About? Is there a position in your life that you would ever be where you would consider yourself successful, happy, fulfilled, or is it just an elusive dream that you follow and chase the rest of your life? Is there such a thing as financially free, or is the right amount of money you know, another 100,000 more than what I have right now. Is there ever a point where you can let yourself, can you let yourself win? I've done it at age 40, and yet my wealth kept growing. I said I was done. I didn't need to grow. It grew. I did it again at 50. I said, I got to stop trying to grow. I've got enough money now to live the rest of my life. And back then, I didn't believe I'd live past age 65. My wealth has grown exponentially again since then. And so I'm at the point now where I'm saying, Dell, just relax. Enjoy it. And you constantly have to push the button called relax and not just keep striving and grinding the rest of your life. You have to allow yourself to win. Somewhere along the way, you have to go, I won. I did it. And I've told myself that at many different levels of wealth. Again, I'm not talking about me to impress you about what I've done. I'm just sharing my experiences. And you might have done that when you got your first job. I remember when I made $100,000 in a job, I go, that's something I never dreamed I'd do. I didn't have a college degree. My dad never made hundred grand in a year. And uh, when I made hundred grand a year at a job, I go like, wow, that is the most unbelievable thing in the world. I am so successful. And yet I was so far from successful. It's pitiful. It's not even, you can't even conceive the difference between the wealth that you can make and that which a job provides for you. So I've got an email here today I've been sharing with you. I shared the first half of it with you last segment. Second half, this gentleman has found his happiness level. And I'm just reading this to you because I want you to understand that you may have chosen too high a goal for your life. Or maybe not. It doesn't really mean that I'm trying to tell you to hold back your desires. What it really means is if you listen to how happy this guy is where he's at, which relates to the Mexican fisherman story, happiness is not a number of zeros on the back of your name. So I'm going to read on. It says, I now know the difference between living as a free man and living as a corporate wage slave. Love this guy's words, man. Frankly, most of your guests are rather boring and put me to sleep. But they do have a great plan. I would like to talk on your show about roommates and saving the house without having to replace the middle class job, which I presently cannot replace. I could also talk about surviving a layoff in 2008 and still owning my home and property. So his success was getting laid off and still saving his house. His success is having passive income while he has a regular Blue-collar job, driving the bus. I read on. I could talk about things like puking outside on the sidewalk from a stress attack after layoffs were announced, getting yelled at by a manager for making sensible suggestions in a meeting, feeling like being tied to the railroad tracks, finding 
that first roommate who paid me $430 for a room, the roommates who have always short on money, and the government would let them stay even if they don't pay. One way to screen by just letting them talk. They will show you if they are dependable or not. The feeling of taking cash to the bank and when then using it to make your mortgage payment. And the roommate who lied to me and told me he had a job working for himself, even though he was on supplemental income. I wrote that guy an eviction notice 15 minutes after he moved in. He had these weird little marsupials, pets, that threw their poop outside the cage onto the brand new carpet, and the other roommates who warped their wooden floorboards. Then, of course, I could want to hear how lifestyles would help someone like me transition to buying another property, even though I have student debt, if possible. Could I buy another property? You could talk about how to screen for renters. You could totally transition from my situation to becoming a real professional landlord and not just being a slumlord like me. Now, he's right. Right there is, would have been my company. He asked the question and he answered it. First thing he needs to do is learn how to screen tenants. That's the first thing he needs to do. Secondly, we can show him how, even with bad credit, that he could probably figure out how to buy more properties. I mean, there are some different systems he could use to do that. It's not standard, not traditional financing, but I'm sure there's other things out there that he could get to that would work, okay? But he'd have to have the information. Now, I'm not asking this guy to join if he's listening, and I'm sure he'll eventually listen to this either live or he'll hear it as a podcast. I'm not asking him to join. I think he's he's done well himself for what he wants. But what he won't get here is he won't get a lot of support for wanting people to get into his roommating theory. That's not the quality of lifestyle that most Lifestyles members want. They don't want to even think about doing something like that, although I've had people do it. So again, it's wherever you are in life. He goes on. If you don't want to let me talk on your show, that's cool. But I can tell you that I have stories that will surely entertain your listeners, like how I asked my roommates for extra money because her friend spent the night. She didn't have it, so her friend helped me deliver phone books all afternoon. I mean, this is getting right down to bartering even. This is the barest of bare essentials I've ever heard in my entire life. This is even a better story than the story of the guy that I helped you know, buy the five houses so he could live and, and do nothing but fish all day long. Thanks, Dell, for putting on a great radio show. I can totally relate to your experience in the workplace, like that job you had delivering milk. I briefly had a produce delivery job in Austin in the 80s. They would stack a box of produce on the cab of the pickup every day. Each day it would fall off during the drive and they would leave it on my drive, driving and take the money out of my check. I don't even get that one. They stick it on the cab of the truck. That's insane. goes on, every time I collect money from my roommates, I appreciate the fact that I'm working for myself and I don't have to take crap from morons anymore. Signed, fan of your show. What can you say about something like that, guys? What do you say about something like that? Well, the guy who had uh, posted the Mexican fisherman story, he had something to say about it. He has had a follow-up article, and he made 10 points, 10 takeaways from the the fisherman story that he thought were important. I'm going to cover these 10 points because actually some of them are pretty good. Either way... I just don't know how to proceed after talking. This guy's email blew me away, quite honestly. And he wants to come on the show. I'm afraid of what he'll say, quite honestly. I mean, this guy could come up with anything, you know, and and that's okay. I might let him come on just just for the fun and the entertainment of it. But the bottom line is what I don't want to do is I don't want to pollute your ideas that having roommates and living on next to nothing is what Lifestyles is about. It really isn't. He took some of the ideas that we espouse and used them to where he wanted to use them, to the level he wanted to use them and utilize them. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's absolutely fine. In fact, I would clap for him and say, hey, congratulations that you are so self-aware. You're so self-aware you know what you want and that you're happy at the level you're living at. And I would also have a secondary question, which is probably illegitimate question. That is, where is the woman in your life and or male? Where is your spouse in life? And my guess is if he had one, he lost he or she because of the way he lives. I don't know that you can find somebody else who would be all excited about that quality of lifestyle, but maybe I'm wrong. And I'm reading that into the fact that he didn't bring one up in his stories. So that might be an overreach. But that would be one of my first questions is, where is your emotional satisfaction in your life? 
You know, part of the reason that I go out with uh, friends is emotional satisfaction. I mean, we're thinking about uh, adding a lot of more touchy-feely stuff to the program once the COVID stuff is gone, because people are calling out to us, screaming out to us, begging us to get back to where we had all those touchy-feely moments in our program. And as soon as we can, we're going to bring them back. Why? Because we think that's important. We'll take a short break, come back and finish this thing up. Now, here's some more unconventional wisdom to set you free from the man on a mission to retire America, one person at a time, Del Wamsley. Welcome back to Del Wamsley Radio Show. Today, we've been discussing um, the question of what's it all about? How much wealth do you really need before you're happy? Or will you ever be happy? Can you pick a goal and hit it? And then say, I'm there, I'm done, I'm happy, now I can go spend the rest of my life having a good time? Or is that just not the way it works? For some of us, it's such that the working is what we live for. The grinding is what we live for. Take away the work, and you take away our self-identity. There are a tremendous number of reports out there that men, and I don't know about women, but I've read about men, die very quickly after they stop working. In other words, if they retire at 64, most men die within two to four years after they stop working because there's nothing to live for anymore. Now, I don't know if it's a corollary that they're quitting working because they're almost ready to die or if having nothing to do leads to dying. Obviously, having nothing to do is definitely leading to Alzheimer's because you're not focusing on anything intently anymore. You're not using your brain, and what you don't use, you lose. So there is some reality to that, I think, but I don't really know. And so here I am, every male in my family except one died by 65, 66 years of age, thinking that I was going to die by 65, and here I am, and I've got all kinds of things wrong with me, and all kinds of things have been done to me. I had all kinds of different operations. I have cancer. I could go on and on and on. Let me put it to you this way. Anything that can go wrong has gone wrong and or is in the process of going wrong. Everything in my blood work that should be high is low and everything in my blood work that should be low is high. So here I am. I'm at 65. Maybe I'm an to get right at 65 like we had planned. I don't feel that way. I don't psychologically see it that way. So then you ask yourself, well, what is enough? And yet, this year, I bought five more businesses. Now, I have to say, I'm done for the season. I'm done for the year. I I cut myself off. I said, you can't buy any more businesses. I've refused you to do that. Now you got to get out there and get your hobbies in line, get your fitness in line, get your travel in line, get out there and touch some people's lives and change some people's lives for them, do some things for other people. Get out there and stop worrying about making more money. That's the type of reality. So I don't have an answer for you. Quite honestly, this is one of those things where I don't have an answer, except that you should think about it. I have the answer that I'm as far financially as I need to be, but I also realize the fact that a whole bunch of cash sitting in the bank doing nothing is really useless and a target for somebody else. And the amount of interest they pay right now, cash on hand is worthless. It's almost worthless other than safety net. So I'm going to read to you the guy that uh, published the Mexican fisherman version had another article, parallel article that said 10 things that this fisherman's story could help you understand. So I'm going to go through these real quick. We only have a couple minutes left. Number one, stories are powerful. A little story inspired change in my life and work and still makes me think about what matters most. It's also encouraging to me to share personal stories and invite you to new stories. That's what I do every single day here, guys. I'm just sharing little stories with you. I'm a what they call a parable teacher. I teach by stories. Number two, change takes time. Even though I was working to make more and own more when I found this story, it kept me working on me. When I look at my sales numbers, my eyes would roll over and these words 
I wasn't ready at first, but then I curious and then I became committed that there is the story working in your life, giving it room, making time for you instead of making time for work is basically what he's saying. I agree with that. It's something you just got to let seep in. That's why I'm starting the seepage right now by doing the show today. Number three, small is beautiful. In the story of the Mexican fisherman, a small boat provided a beautiful life. You don't need an impressive title, a big car, a big boat, or a big house, or a big business to live a beautiful life and be a beautiful person. I agree with that 100%. Number four, you already have it all. If you have nagging feeling that you could do better, make more, and deserve to upgrade, remember that the secret to having it all is recognizing that you already do have it all. Interesting concept. I've heard that concept before. You know, if you realize you really have everything you need right now, then you don't need more. And I'm not talking about people sitting in the street starving. That's a whole different story. But from the average person, we've got everything we need. We're 20 pounds, 100 pounds overweight. We eat too much. You know, we party too much. We live in too large a home. We drive too expensive a car. Most of us already are there. Number five, advice is nice, but intuition is better. I agree with that. Number six, time is now. Do you want to enjoy your work and life now or work your job you hate and endure a stressful life so you might someday find joy 20 or 30 years from now? Boy, that is right on. It's not the money. It's a lifestyle. But if you don't grab that lifestyle now when you're young, I've said this forever. For 30 years, I've been on the radio. And here's the answer. I had all my fun I could when I was young because I knew when I got old, I wouldn't be physically fit enough to have the kind of fun I had back then. Next one. Put a price on your life. Not even a million dollars is worth giving up your life. Number eight, spend time with your amigos. The wife, children, and amigos were all an integral part of the fisherman's life. Number nine, smarter isn't wiser. Catching more fish and growing the business was very logical advice, but offered little wisdom. Number 10, protect less and share more. The story of the Mexican fisherman is originally told by Henrik Boyle about an encounter between an enterprising tourist and a small fisherman on a European coast, which the tourist suggests are the fisherman can improve his life. He then told, retold, retold, and readapted in almost every language in the country, in the world. Yes, my friends, this is a story that every language in the world should hear. Every person out there listening to this radio show should hear. Whether you like the gentleman that sent the email and are happy with living on $1,600 a month of passive income, or whether you want to live at a higher level, the basic principle is the same. What is that basic principle that I live by day in and day out? It's not the money. It's the lifestyle. Have a wonderful day. See you tomorrow. The information and opinions you hear on the Del Wamsley Radio Show are those of the host, Del Wamsley, his guests, and his callers, and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of this station, its affiliates, its management, or advertisers. The Del Wamsley Show is for entertainment purposes only. Please consult a professional regarding your personal investment needs. Nothing presented on the Del Wamsley Show constitutes an endorsement, recommendation, offer, or solicitation to buy or sell any product or security.